nuclear waste is not a problem. It has never been a problem. It's a problem for those that don't want to see the solution, that are anti-nuclear. Because fast breather reactor can transmute those uh, transuranic actinids that are the, the source of, that, of the radioactivity of the uh, used fuel. Because it's used fuel, it's not waste. I mean, light water reactors, that is what we've had in the last decades, they, they can burn about from three to 5% of the, of the fuel. So what we have is partially used fuel, partially, very partially, only three to 5%. So the, there is a lot of energy in what we call waste. So what is the actual waste? The actual waste is not using it. The actual waste would be to bury it in, in permanent uh, uh, deposits. No, no. The deep the, the geological uh, is not the solution. It's, it would be waste. I mean, would you put gold again inside the mine? No. <laughs> well, it's like, it, it's the same. It's yeah, useful. It has a, a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Actually, if we use fast nuclear reactor, I mean, if we, those are called generation four reactors. Yeah. If generation four reactors that are nothing new, I mean, the, the, we know the technology since the fifties, it's nothing new. And, and Russia, they have several of them. And France had the, the Super Phoenix that was a fast breeder reactor and was operating for, for many years. Uh, so it's not new. It's just a matter of deciding to go into that way. But when fast nuclear reactors were under development in many countries, including Germany, Germany has a very good one. Uh, then uh, the anti-nuclear uh, movement mm, made the nuclear to stagnate, you know, uh, during uh, at the end of the 90s. Yeah. And then after 20 years, China and Russia, again, they are developing that technology. Mm -hmm. And and here in the States too, basically the Terra Power Natrium is, is a fast reactor. It's not a breather reactor because it's too small. It's a, an SMR, but a larger version of the natrium could could be uh, very, I mean, could, could burn uh, used fuel. Mm -hmm. You know, to put this into perspective and to see how powerful nuclear energy is, the natrium reactor or the Terra Power natrium reactor backed by Bill Gates, or the X Energy, the XC100, that is another SMR under development in, in, in the US. The, the, the waste generated by the energy required by a person for the whole life, for 80 years, would be 170 grams. 170 grams of waste for your whole life. That's amazing. Wow. Okay. That That's... is a little bit more than two grams, two yeah. grams per year. So ridiculous. Yeah. Per person. Yeah. This is... Welcome to the show, Oscar L. Martin. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to have you on my show for the first time. Um, Oscar, Oscar L. Martin. let me just turn off my YouTube. Okay, uh, Oscar, how are you doing? Good, thank you very much for, for inviting me to participate here today. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. So, Oscar, um, I've been following you for quite some time, and um, I just find your your content that you've been publishing, the articles, your your analysis of a lot of different sectors uh, within the techno uh, technological realm, uh, extremely fascinating. I myself, I mean, I'm uh, originally, you know, I have a legal background, but then, you know, I, I'm now totally into Bitcoin and do podcasts and, you know, work for a, a Bitcoin company. Um, and um, it has to do with a lot of first principles and, of course, with technology, with uh, betterment for humanity. So maybe we can uh, first, let's talk about you, your background. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Where do you come from? What, uh, how, do you, how, do you, how did you find your path into this, um, uh, let's just say, you know, research and development? 
And yeah, why don't you just uh, talk a little bit about yourself, um, and uh, and then we can go into uh, you know some other rabbit holes. Yeah, well, uh, I started as as a uh, electrical engineer, uh, designing analog digital circuits, uh, and later on I moved to to Hewlett Packard in Houston, and uh, from there I I, I learned uh, to fly. Uh, then I, I got. I, I developed a passion for aviation, and I transitioned to uh, to an aerospace company. Uh, then, well, uh, to defense, and later on, I, I wanted to go higher, so I joined a company, uh, and I led a couple of subsystems for for the Galileo satellites uh, back in in the almost two decades ago. Um, and well, uh, I came back to, to the States and, um, uh, with a previous, uh, employer, I work also in the energy industry, uh, in thermal control with, um, uh, working, uh, designing systems. My team was designing system for nuclear power plants or, uh, concentrated solar power, high temperature, basically. And uh, well, uh, I rejoin aviation. I work also in another company doing large screens, video screens for like the the one that that was once uh, covering the Nasdaq building uh, was made by, by my team. And well, a little bit of uh, these three main businesses: electronics, aerospace, energy. And well, uh, I. I later transitioned to a more business role, uh, restructuring companies and and trying to optimize design systems, design processes, trying to implement uh, be best practice such as uh, first principle um, first principle working, 340, uh, lean, uh, those kind of things, like the keys rule, the, 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 the all keys rule, the keep it simple, stupid rule. And and those things that that really uh, you find that companies and even the government they don't know about that and there is a lot of inefficiencies out there and well we have really really big examples like the SLS rocket in in, in space or the 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 solar and wind fallacy that we are falling into lately and. Well, th those kind of things. I love technology. I love. I I, I like anything related to the five foundational uh, areas of technology: energy, uh, ma materials, uh, information, biology, and transportation. So anything regarding those five foundational uh, technologies is really my passion. Yeah, uh, you know your uh, you have sort of a title or uh, a phrase in your in your LinkedIn um, uh, profile, uh, um, transforming the present and creating the future, and I find it really uh, fascinating because we also you know within the broader Bitcoin community, a lot of us you know who, uh, there's a lot of Austrian economists. Uh, I don't know, maybe you've heard of Safedan Amus, who's also written about uh, the Bitcoin standard or the fiat standard, like the you know the root causes of all the symptoms we have. On every level you can think of, <laughs> uh, up to the you know criminal activities on a broader scale. But you know I'm I'm not gonna go there yet. Um, it's just that um, sometimes when I talk to some people um, or I've read some books where they an analyze the technological process or the the delays, the postponements, the the blockages of technological innovation. Do you find it a little bit weird or strange that within the last, let's say, plus minus hundred years, we have not had a really uh, fundamental change or transformation, as you would maybe call it, uh, within the propulsion system, for example? It's just one example. Let's say, you know, aviation, aerospace. Isn't that a little bit strange that we haven't had really uh, when we, when it comes to transportation? I mean, we could talk about anything, any kind of uh, technological yeah. sector. Do you find it strange? <laughs> or No, I, I don't find it strange. I think that there was a huge, a, a, a huge uh, evolution during the uh, first, the, during the, the mid 20th century, 
with the invention of aviation and the development. So that 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 grew up very quickly. In a matter of three decades, uh, it became, uh, I mean, the norm. And, and aviation is now commonplace. And it was 40 years ago. I mean, it's not new. In the 80s or in the 70s, it was normal flight from, from uh, one continent to, to another one. And well, yeah, it, it, there was a lot of difference uh, from jumping from, from a boat, from, from transatlantic to an aircraft. So yeah, the, the, the distances, have shrunk a lot due to that. Why we have not progressed? Because probably it was enough so far. And there isn't any reason to change or to reach faster. I mean, now we have the opportunity to do that. Uh, it's, well, the, the technology is almost there with uh, suborbital transportation. Uh, SpaceX uh, is about to do it with the Starship system. Uh, it, it could perfectly move 400 to 1,000 people from one continent to another continent for an affordable price, about $5,000 per trip. I mean, still a luxury, but the first uh, commercial flights were also luxury. If you see pictures from the 50s, 70s, from the 60s. That's a good point. That's a good point you're bringing it up. Yeah, because um, so sorry to interrupt. You. It's just a very important point. Is that uh, it's it's it, there's a a handful of authors or technological experts or you know analysts who who have also historically uh, compared the technologies. Like there was like uh, I don't know there were technological developments in the aerospace and or or uh, transportation industry like with aviation, where you could literally see that that the speed had had really accelerated. But then from the I don't know from where when exactly that took place but somewhere between the 60s and 70s all of a sudden it it declined so what happened to the concord for example other i don't know even within the military industrial complex why wasn't there like a pro, like a adaptation or further development of those innovate innovative technologies within the civilian for example industry you know yeah so well the the, the concord issue is, is about Cost and, and pollution, in this case, noise, uh, more than any other thing. Um, also, uh, uh, CO2 emissions and, and, uh, and NOx emissions, all that. But noise was the, the biggest problem. And, uh, and cost. I mean, it was really, really expensive to maintain that, that uh, aircraft. So really, the best and there wasn't any real need. I mean, the, the business case was very thin. So that's why um, right right now, uh, supersonic or even hypersonics, it's not the, the right way to move around within the atmosphere. I mean, it's like trying to go at 300 miles per hour uh, inside water. The, the, it's, it's not possible. So the best way is to 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 lift the, the 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 boat from the water and fly. Well, the same applies to atmosphere. I mean, if you want to go faster, the drag of the atmosphere is so high at high speed that uh, there is no case on doing that. It's a lot easier to go outside the atmosphere, go from one point to the other, and then enter and, and landing. So it is the same principle. That there is no point on going faster within the atmosphere. If you want to go faster, go outside the atmosphere. The atmosphere is very thin, it's just 100 kilometers, so uh, 60 miles. So go, going outside is quite easy. Uh, orbital speed is, a, is, a, is, a, is something very different. I mean, you don't need, you, you need a lot less energy going from one point to the other uh, with a suborbital flight than going to orbit, because going to orbit, you need to go there and to get up to a lot of speed to to remain in orbit so i think that that is the that that's going to be the future the future is not going to be supersonics or hypersonics there will be probably a very small niche market for a product but it won't be the big revolution of uh airliners for instance 
So I think that the future of airliners are suborbital transportation. Um, well, okay. What about because you write and publish a lot of comment very succinctly about uh, you know um, from first principles, you know, like when it comes to research and development, energy efficiency, or propulsion system, uh, even, you know, let's just say, you know, uh, cars, for example, you know, you talk about a lot of hydrogen, like how far is hydrogen. it like, wow. it, uh, hi yeah, well, I mean, Hi hydrogen has uh, yeah. a lot of uh, implications, even more for space right now that Airbus is, is actually working hard on uh, bringing the, the, the next generation of aircraft based on hydrogen. So, yeah, I think that, that, uh, hydrogen, I believe that if nothing else, if there isn't a really, really, really breakthrough in energy storage, I think that hydrogen is the best way to, to implement electric aviation. Not, not using hydrogen for combustion, because it would be very inefficient, but using fuel cells and using hydrogen as a way to store electricity energy, I mean, electric energy. Uh, and well, I did, yeah, I, I, I wrote an article a while ago, a while ago, I think that it was four years ago, uh, about that. I did a small feasibility analysis uh, from the gravimetric point of view, from the mass. And uh, uh, well, uh, basically, if, if we want to implement a, Typical single ISIL uh, airliners like a 737 or an Airbus 320, that, that, that size, about 200 passengers. Uh, the typical weight is about the, the maximum takeoff weight at, the ta at takeoff is about 56 tons. Well, a battery based aircraft will need only for the propulsion about 127 tons only for that. So it's, it's more than twice the, the weight of the whole aircraft. So it's not possible using batteries. And that was taking into account a breakthrough in batteries, uh, batteries capable of store, of store about 500 watt hours per kilogram. That, it, that doesn't exist today. <laughs> I mean, even in that case, it would be impossible. So electric aviation using batteries, so uh, as of today and in the next 20 or 30 years, it won't be possible. What is the alternative using hydrogen? Uh, there are different ways of store hydrogen. You can compress it uh, or you can liquefy it and maintain at very, very, very cryogenic temperatures. Well, using uh, compressed, uh, tanks, compressed hydrogen, it's not possible either. It's very, very massive. It requires a lot of mass, not for the hydrogen, but for the tanks. So uh, using compressed hydrogen could be possible. It's possible for road cars. Uh, actually, here in Southern California, there are many, many around here. I see a lot of uh, hydrogen cars, more than Tesla uh, 10 years ago, really. So I see a future for hydrogen cars, uh, but for aviation is different. For aviation, uh, you need uh, to save a lot of weight. And the only way as of today is to liquefy uh, hydrogen and use it, well, as, as the SLS, as, as rockets, you know, li liquid hydrogen. And, and the, the problem is that we we have a lot of manufacturing and knowledge about turbines so the the industry is now trying to substitute uh, kerosene with hydrogen using still using turbines for instance this last week i think uh, rolls royce announced that they have success, successfully tested the the first hydrogen uh, and turbine their first hydrogen turbine because the Russians did it in the in the 50s exactly so, yeah yeah what was the result and I mean could you go a little into detail like no it was fine the problem was the cost because <laughs> the kerosene was uh, a lot more affordable than than hydrogen and in the 50s uh, uh pollution was not a factor <laughs> yeah. 
So, and even less in Russia. <laughs> so that's why hydrogen was abandoned as a means for, for uh, aircraft propulsion. And uh, well, but right now it's, it's, it's feasible, it's possible. The, uh, in any case, uh, turbines, hydrogen turbines, they still pollute because in turbines, you burn the fuel, but you burn also the nitrogen that is in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is 80% nitrogen. So in, a, in, a, in, in any air breathing uh, system, you are breathing oxygen, 20% oxygen, well, 19% oxygen, and 80% uh, nitrogen. So in that combustion chamber, you are burning the fuel and the nitrogen, and the, the 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 byproducts of the nitrogen combustion are very toxic. So, uh, and they generate a lot of, uh, 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 I mean, um, health uh, problems. They can even produce acid rain, and well, uh, hopefully, aviation is not as important to generate acid rain. <laughs> Um, it was very common uh, because it was part of the coal power plants. They, they release a lot of uh, nitrogen oxide. Anyway, for, for aviation, uh, the, the best way from my point of view is by using, well, the, the only way <laughs> so far is by using uh, hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, because otherwise it would be too, too massive to... to, to the weight would be too high to for for the takeoff, and um, fuel cells for using hydrogen to uh, generate electricity without toxic byproduct. The only byproduct of fuel cells is water, liquid water. So no pollution, uh, clean ele electricity, and well, uh, that way is possible. The, the engines probably should be superconducting engines. That is not a problem because actually the biggest problem of superconducting is to keep cryogenic temperature. But since you are carrying uh, liquid, hi li liquid hydrogen, you can, you can use that liquid hydrogen when you are feeding the, the fuel cells. You can go through the, through the engines and cool the, the superconducting coils to reduce the weight. I see. To okay. reduce a lot the, the weight. Of the of the engines of the electric motors that move the, the the fans, so that way is possible. The remaining problem is the size, the size of of hydrogen because it's it's very light. Even in liquid form, it's very very light. So it it, it requires the density is very it's very small, so it requires a lot of volume. So it's good for the mass because. It, it, the weight is in this case is even below uh, mm. the 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 current weight of the propulsion system of aircraft. I mean, there would be probably about three more tons available for payload. Mm -hmm. But the problem will be the volume. So that's why uh, right now you can see if you use Google for hydrogen aircraft designs, all that you see like. Uh, la like the Beluga uh, Airbus, but instead of carrying, uh, instead of a, a, a bay, is a, a huge hydrogen tank or things very ugly designed. Why? Because the volume required for that is really, really high. And right now we use, well, it's very common to use the, the tube plus wings in the, in the, in, for, for the fuselage design. The airframe usually is that. It's a tube. And you know the typical mm -hmm. shape. That shape is very easy to manufacture because the tube is very easy. You manufacture different sections exactly the same, so it's very easy to manufacture uh, in, in 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 a line. The only different things would be the, the the wings that are not that easy to manufacture. But uh, if we leave that. Um, that philosophy of tube plus wing, and we leverage the current manufacturing technologies such as 3D printing and all the, all mm -hmm. the computing systems that right. we have now. This is exponentially, so, I mean, developing, right? I mean, especially in yeah. this, would it, would you say so? I mean, that is an exponential curvature in, in this kind of, whatever it is, AI, 3D printing, or other auxiliary, like, 
technology that can you know help with the I don't know production or yeah that, that <laughs> is the cross pollination between yeah. between different industries manufacturing industries avi aviation uh, technology artificial intelligence and and software in general so those three areas they they can they can uh, create a, a very good synergy for aircraft uh, manufacturing and we, if we switch from tube plus wing to shapes like the B2 at uh, the uh, uh, flying wing uh, what we call blend, blended uh, wing body uh, or lifting body. Mm -hmm. That is it's like a large wing, you know, it's like a delta wing uh, without the tube. So that way we can, it's like if all the aircraft was the wings, but a lot larger. So inside the wings, there is a lot more volume possible than, I mean, that shape. You have a lot more volume than in the tube plus wings. So since the weight is lower and the problem was the volume, if we use that, that shape, it will fit perfectly. So the, basically it is possible. It's not right here. I mean, it's not, uh, it's something that has to be developed and it presents issues uh, for for airports because they will need to introduce hydrogen fuel systems storage and all that so the technology allowed for uh, hydrogen propulsion i mean electric propulsion using hydrogen for storing energy but uh, there are many challenges ahead but anyway there are challenges everywhere. And if we want to reduce the carbon footprint, we need to do something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I ask you something fundamentally? I mean, because uh, before we go on, I mean, uh, first of all, I mean, I wanted to go now into the rabbit hole of uh, nuclear technology. And because you publish also articles or commentary about modular reactors. And uh, let me just get one topic or one thing that's like a splinter in my head always or uh, during you know all these discussions we've had also with with other people and 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 um you might also have you ever heard of jeff booth um the author of um the prize of tomorrow why deflation is the key to an abundant future mm -hmm. okay maybe that would maybe would be a amazing conversation i think you you the two of you because he says you know technology is deflationary and the te technology you know it's also the purpose to uh um, make things more, you know, com comfortable for for people, you know, for humanity, to to lower the price, and uh, because we never had even our generations, we never lived uh, on a gold standard, let alone on a Bitcoin standard, because then you know we would see from first principles, we would see a deflationary uh, civilization, <laughs> as, uh, as to speak. We would see you know uh, exponential you know development and innovation. Uh, in every, you know, on every level of technology, uh, all these things that you talk about, uh, it would lower the prices. Uh, we as society, as humanity, as people, you know, would, would benefit from, from all these technologies. Let me just get one thing maybe out of the way first, because, uh, and, you know, we don't have to go into conspiracy theories or whatever, but uh, I want to talk to you about the military industrial complex. And, now, um, when I look at your curriculum, Vita, I mean, you do work indirectly or directly for within or somehow, you know, let's just say indirectly for the military industrial come, maybe you can, you know, chime in uh, uh, if I'm not correct on this, but could there be, I mean, I, I just can't fathom that in the last, let's just say, at least since the end of second world war or in the last 50, 60 years, um, I can't believe, you know, that the military industrial complex, who is mostly, you know, unaccountable. I mean, there are just areas where it's like no need to know, you know, <laughs> they're unaccountable with criminal immunity and there is no like investigation, you know, when the, the trillions missing. <laughs> um, you might remember, you know, shortly before 9-11, you know, uh, who was the Rumsfeld who said, you know, there are like two or three trillion dollars missing. I'm just I'm just asking myself like where does this money go? I mean within the compartmentalized military industrial technological sectors 
there hasn't been like any technological development. I mean, I'm not going into speculation, but just from your depth of knowledge, experience, or interaction with other ex technology experts. I mean, where where is all this uh, money flow, you know, uh, poured into? Where where is the technological innovation? Are there patents that have been seized in the name of national security? I mean, is there any like bigger picture you can communicate uh, to to the? Well, if I, if I have to summarize in one word where the military money goes, I would choose inefficiency. Is, but that could be also applied to any other <laughs> uh, government investment. I mean, uh, because in energy, we see the same. In, 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 in the health industry, we see the same. So at least here in the US. So, uh, yeah, well, the, wh where the military money goes? Well, basically to maintain the establishment, the, the status quo, quo of uh, the big primes. And, and that is something that started in the, after the 60s, you know, uh, those, the, the consolidation and, and all the fusions, uh, the merges between uh, all those companies that, were competitors uh, during the 50s and 60s. Uh, that created a dangerous uh, oligopoly uh, in the defense industry. And uh, that coupled with the very bad approach to develop to, su to supply chain and development in the uh, defense industry made the rest. I mean, right, uh, because that forced the uh, prime contractors, Boeing, Lockheed, Northrop, uh, to work the same way. Uh, NASA is the civil uh, version of that way of work. You know, very inefficient, very expensive because the money goes to unneeded things. Uh, you know, basically it, it all comes on how uh, government wants things to be planned. I mean, they, they they want to anticipate as much as possible and they use that anticipation as a requirement. So planning become a essential part of everything to the point that you need to plan everything before doing it and it's impossible. And if you do that, no matter what, you will find problems afterwards. And if you want to develop something new, you cannot plan something that you haven't yet created. So if you are uh, required to plan, then you are required not to innovate. And that is basically the big cancer of uh, the large uh, project. That's why after the Apollo era, uh, there wasn't any big improvement in aviation or uh, or uh, space, aerospace development in the space. Why? Because basically the FAA, um, NASA, the DOD, uh, Every, all these governmental agencies uh, and departments, they want uh, to plan everything. They are not, they, they want to innovate, but they are not creating the framework that could foster innovation. So basically, what would be the solution? The solution would be a transition. The, the Space Force tried to do it try to get rid of all the past and try to do a, a, a new approach that that was first used in, in software development, agile de development. And, and that can be applied to, uh, to, to many areas in our lives. I mean, to, to many development. In aviation, it can be applied. In, in uh, energy, it can be applied uh, in anything. Why? Because basically, uh, what you need to do is just incremental work, not planning everything at the at the beginning and then execution ex executing it. No, uh, innovation is 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 an is a 
ongoing process. And a trial and error. I mean, we have, to, we have to let, you know, innovative, intelligent people or, or you know, uh, <laughs> inventors, you know, engineers or, you know, technological experts, like, let's do their experiments, like trial and error. It's You can't, you know, you said you can, we cannot plan. Of course, we can't plan because there needs a, a lot of, I mean, uh, free space, like thinking outside the, the box, outside the paradigm. Is I mean, am I going in the right direction? Or Yes. Yes, you, you need to think outside the box, but uh, I think that the problem is a standardization. I mean, we want and the government and the regulations want to standardize everything. But if you create a very rigid standardization, you don't leave room for innovation. For innovation, you need to try and to to, to get to, to new uh, areas, to, to new inventions. Serendipity is something that only happens if you do things if you do the same thing the same way you won't get anything new and that's why all the aircraft in the last 30 years are exactly the same exactly yeah yeah uh no no new uh, n nothing new even the last engine uh that is being developed by by ge uh that uh, has a morphing system to be to be able to be very, very efficient, very fuel efficient at one time, but very fast and, and very powerful when when required, it's not new. The 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 Archangel Archangel twelve from uh, I mean the the SR seventy one the Blackbeard uh, that that was a morphing engine and that was designed in the in, in the fifties mm -hmm. seventy years ago. Amazing. So yeah. it's not yeah. new. We are, it's new because that model, that exact model is new, but the technology and the ideas are not new. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's what I was alluding to. Yeah. 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 Who's innovating right now? I think that the innovation is coming from startups, that they are not very organized themselves. And that messy framework mm -hmm. uh, foster innovation. So, uh, my my uh, my approach uh, for optimizing this kind of uh, innovation product development frameworks is uh, first to to not designing uh, with with the safety factors and all that at the beginning, but doing a straightforward design mm -hmm. without safety factors, mm -hmm. and then add the safety factor at the end. Why? Because right now we have different teams in different areas. When, when you are designing an aircraft, you have propulsion, you have aerodynamics, you have uh, a, a avionics, you have controls, many, many different teams. But if, if you do the mass budget and then you the, the propulsion team say, no, it's gonna be six tons for the engines, uh, and then they say, no, I'm going to apply a safety factor of um, of 10%, 20%, usually it's 20%, 20%. Then you end up telling that your engines is going to be uh, 7,200 7, uh, kilograms, yes. more than seven tons. Then you will need more lift capability more the, the structures of the wings, the structure of the aircraft has to be uh, thicker to withstand more weight. And if you need more weight, you need more propulsion. Mm -hmm. So you end up with a deadly spiral of very, very bad things. So the best thing is to apply the nominal need and then afterwards adding the, the safety factor. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, you said different times, uh, First, design from first principle. That that is really, uh, it's not new actually. Mm -hmm. uh, Elon Musk has made it very uh, very popular because mm -hmm. they've been very very. Uh, they've been, he's he's been pushing a lot uh, on on using this, and it's a great idea. I mean, this first principle design is just take whatever thing that is already done and break it down. To, to to its atomic parts or atomic functions and then build what you want to build from those atomic functions. Well, that's the top level idea. Then you can apply, for instance, a, a methodology, a heuristic called 340 
to find a better solution. Um, I mean, it's some, it's a very uh, good tool. But, uh, well, that, that is um, a, a way to innovate. Uh, but anyway, I think that the most powerful tool for, in, for getting something done very quickly and very efficiently is two things. First, the keys rule, they keep it simple, stupid. The best part is no part. The best process is no process. That's clear. If you, if you can remove things, remove it. Uh, you can add, add it later, but if you can remove it, remove it. That applies to product, that applies to companies, that applies to organizations, that applies to the government too. So everywhere, uh, keep it simple with fewer parts, with fewer elements, you have fewer interfaces. With fewer interfaces, you have uh, fewer uh, risk of miscommunication, of failures, human error. So it's going to be an exponential benefit. And the other key uh, thing is the, the, the fail rule, the, the three fails. Fail fast, fail early, and fail inexpensive. The fail fast is do very short uh, design cycles. You know, in software, it's very easy. You change uh, uh, the code, and usually it's, it's very easy to to execute and to debug that routine if, if, if it's doing things right. I mean, it doesn't take that long. Probably even even very, very large projects can be uh, tested in a matter of minutes, if not hours. But but the same, well, not, not hours, but probably week. In a week, you can do a, a test cycle. Uh, if it's not a week, it's two weeks. And that way you can improve a lot your, your system. That is the, the, the fail fast. Fail early. Fail early means start testing as soon as possible. That goes completely against the planning framework. So that means that, hey, start doing, do a step. Uh, because that step is going to teach you things that planning won't I mean, planning is, is, is actually a waste because it's, it's not productive. It, it, it helps. It helps when you do repetitive things like buildings or houses in a, yeah. it, it helps. Yeah. But it's just too many parameters, probably just not foreseeable or not, it cannot be calculated maybe. Right. I mean, you have cannot, to. Yeah. It cannot be anticipated. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that creates an over. Uh, and, and uh, overwork on top of the real work, which is thinking about the problem, solving problems, creating efficient systems. So that, that is the second, fail fast, start as soon as possible testing. And the third, I, I think that doesn't need any explanation, fail inexpensive, do inexpensive tests. I mean, try to design your tests that they are non-destructive tests. <laughs> So that, that is basically the keys rule mm -hmm. and the fail fast, uh, fail early, uh, fail inexpensive are the two key um, factors. Uh, others, uh, additional things, I always tell my people, hey, focus on interfaces because innovation usually happens at the interfaces and so the errors. Yeah. So uh, be very careful with interfaces. And that's why systems engineering is very important, not only at product level, but at company level. Yeah. When you define an organization and you create the, the processes, the business processes, the interfaces between that process and other processes are usually miscommunication, generates a lot of meetings, meetings that are inefficient because usually are a waste of time most most of the time yeah. so that's why interfaces is a key part in any system mm -hmm. system from a very simple product to a very complex organization such a government so basically that's the the, the idea and if, if you do all that you you will find that it's more profitable more efficient uh, to work smarter than to work harder yeah. Uh, 
and and that's that's really important uh, for anything that I've done so far. Yeah, <laughs> I've been exactly. trying to to innovate not only in the thing that you are doing, but in the process that you apply for doing that thing. Mm-hmm. Say, so, Oscar. I mean, uh, you know, we we talked about uh, or I mentioned, you know, the compartmentalization and and the patent system just uh, is a keyword. But do you see like other root cause or or uh, ask differently? Like, what what could what should be done to facilitate and accelerate and you know foster and 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 accelerate you know the 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 development the the innovation um or the conversion translation from within the military industrial complex to the civilian uh sector i mean is there anything from first principles that you if you just zoom out like what could be because you know we talk about bitcoin we talk about money we always say fix the money you know fix the world like um is there anything you could you've been maybe talking about or thinking about maybe with others what needs to be done like from the first principle from the roots upwards i think that the world cannot learn a lot from the defense industry or the government industry i think that is the opposite <laughs> i think that blockchain could be used in many areas of the government uh are you familiar with them. bitcoin uh, oscar i mean do you know what yeah. okay okay yeah, blockchain could be could be applied to the voting system to avoid all the recounts and all these things. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, but blockchain itself is a very primitive tool. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a process, it's very, actually. You know, it delivers you consistency and you know verifi- uh, verification and and you know what we have in Bitcoin. Like you know, it's just a very primitive, very slow, very uh yeah <laughs> um inefficient you know tool but but uh um, yeah it's inefficient like like i'm talking about like like the monetary structure like one once we you know have once we don't have this fiat structure anymore the central banking governmental structures the centralization once we have decentralized the money what where do you see like where do you see ourselves where do you see uh, technology where do you see humanity yeah. that, well, that should be actually the last final question but <laughs> No, I think I think that money is like energy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, and it follows the same movement, the same flows, more or less. So, banks is like uh, manufacturing plants, and consumers uh, consume energy, but they, they also uh, pay money. So, the the flow is is the same, and and decentralization is something that that. It's a good idea, but I see a big problem. No one wants to give up control. So uh, that's why uh, microgrids in the energy industry or uh, decentralized banking system is something that is very difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. Why? Because... uh, it removes control, and that is something that um, no one wants to to give uh, control is, pa- is power. And but it become, wants- could become obsolete. I mean, not that you know, uh, you know. And who was that? Buckminster Fuller, Fuller Buckminster. What's his name? That he said, you know, don't fight the established or something like that. Don't fight the legacy system, the existing system, but build a new one, create a new one. To make the old one obsolete is that where you would be going in the yeah well that, that exactly but it's, it's difficult i mean it's the only way because the the the, the establishment the old establishment won't change anything mm-hmm. uh before we've been talking to the defense prime contractors they won't be participating in the revolution of new systems uh, uh we see spacex in in space or kratos in in defense uh and the the uh, the cryptocurrency in in the uh, in the finance system in the and all those innovations will happen, as you say, in parallel with the established system. There is no way to for them to participate unless they they are forced to do it, and. Governments are not going to force it. The only way to force them is 
uh, if the customer is really going in that direction because it's better. So what would help? Well, for, for the cryptocurrency and distributed economy, it would help if it could offer interesting, real, tangible benefits to the end user. Means, well, uh, less expensive uh, mortgages uh, or uh, more uh, money security, uh, that kind of things. No inflation for, <laughs> for the Star Trek. No inflation, yeah, but that is a macroeconomy. Well, say, Bitcoin is inflationary. You know, Bitcoin and technology, they just go hand in hand because Bitcoin, you know, has no, uh, there will come a time because it has, you know, there's only 21 million and then there will come a time there is no zero inflation. It's actually, you know, uh, it will benefit uh, everybody because for the first time in history, people will be able to save money, you know, to save value. Yeah, yeah. and produce but, and invest you know but that is that goes against the the, the against Keynesian against the Keynesian Keynesian uh it goes against against global economy I mean <laughs> right now economy is based on growth right basically mm -hmm. uh growth by growing technology or growing population uh or, or growing money growing <laughs> right? debt. money growth and growing so debt. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, usually, yeah, usually population has been the, the biggest driver of, of growth. But, but that is how our economy works, how our world works right now. A company that doesn't grow is actually losing money. So uh, growth is the real benefit uh, in our uh, market economy. So going against that, what we call a sustainable economy, is, is uncharted uh, territory. <laughs> because, uh, and, and it's very difficult to coexist with the market economy. So that's why I, I, I see it would be better, but a lot of things that, that are better remain in, in 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 the world of dreams you know that will never be a reality that's why i'm i'm skeptic about the possibility i mean i'm not a skeptic about the technology and about that i'm skeptic about that it could be eventually change how the world works i mean at least in a in an order manner in a trans uh, with with a smooth transition. Uh, if that happens, it will be based on a revolution, a revolution on something, because it's a huge change. I don't know. Maybe those co those countries that are trying to bet on on that kind of economy, like Argentina, uh, could discover a better way of doing things but since the rest of the world the world bank and all that works in an in, in a different way even if a whole country changed their way of doing economy uh it's very difficult for for even a whole country yeah i mean would you would you say i mean if uh and i see that totally realistically uh within let's just say in the next 10 to 20 years if there's a critical mass of humanity, and it doesn't have to be really a lot. I mean, it could be like three, five, ten percent of Earth's population. Um, you know, adopting Bitcoin um, not only as a settlement layer, but as a you know, with the Lightning Network as a currency. You know, on on a second, would you say uh, that would totally like shift or, or change your perspectives? Your uh, like, what what is your vision? Like, because either they're going to roll out. I mean, they will roll out the central bank digital currencies, which is totally dystopian and controlled, and it's about absolute control. I mean, in their own words, you know, uh, Augustine Carson, you know, the the guy from Bank for International Settlements. Or we going like either I don't know slavery, dystopian slavery, or freedom. So where do you see ourselves? Where do you see humanity? I mean, this is something well, fundamental. I think we need to talk it, about it. Will, it would require something like the um, French Revolution, you know, 
<laughs> Evol- dude, uh, a, a real a real revolution. Why? Because even if people change uh, their way of moving money, uh, paying things, and all that, uh, the the laws, the government, the banks will still be there. And if if uh, there will be always lender and lenders and and, and borrowers in the economy, even if there is, um, uh, if we use cryptocurrency uh, backed by an algorithm instead of uh, instead of gold, you know. Uh, but uh, I- even in that case, I mean, that, that would be the only case, I think. If everyone in a country just don't use the normal way of uh, currency and they switch to a different currency. Yeah. But for doing that, it requires a lot, a lot. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Would you say if so? What if, happens, the conditions, what if the conditions are right? You know, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's well, unbelievable what's going on right now, uh, macroeconomically, geopolitically, uh, inflation, maybe even hyperinflation. We don't know. You know, it could go into any kind of direction. But but the pressure, the pain point is so much. The tipping point is already so close uh, to implosion that people are feeling the pain economically, existentially. You know, they see. I mean, it. it I don't think it would it would take too long. Maybe ten years. Maybe fifteen, twenty years. Uh, uh, like you know, if we are not that optimistic, but. Um, that's what I know about, you know, what do you think? But you know, people, I mean, I, I, I see that even countries that are going through very, that went through very bad times, they're improving. I mean, globally, globally, uh, poverty is, is, well, poverty is, is being reduced and, uh, even, Countries, even the, the, the China, that is a communist country, they embrace the the capitalism. I mean, it's uh, actually it's, it's wild capitalism in, in China. Yeah, is it real capitalism? But it's not free market, right? We don't have free exactly. market. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's 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 well, free market doesn't exist anywhere, not even here in the states. <laughs> yeah. That that's an illusion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> free market with borders is not applicable. Right. <laughs> That's not free market. Mm-hmm. And all the tariffs and and taxes and no. And the the limits imposed by, for instance, in the in the European Union to certain products that are limited. There isn't that thing of the free market. Yeah, with all the zombie companies and the debts and the bailouts, you know, this is not nothing to do with Austrian economics or you know, <laughs> uh, rational yeah. economics. I mean, you know. Yeah, no, China. China has it's, it's a capitalistic uh, uh, economy, but uh, controlled by the government. Right. But what makes it different from the U.S.? The only difference is that. Here, we choose every two, say, two, four, six years, depending on the part of the government. We choose our representatives. And uh, in China, it's only one million people uh, within the party that choose their leaders. Uh, but it's more or less the same. We yeah. have a political establishment. And there are different uh, <laughs> trends that are public here in the States and in China is internally in in the Communist Party, but they also have factions inside. Uh, Yeah. And we have the political party democracy, you know, like where the (laughs) where exactly vote the same parties over and over. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It's just uh, it's just an illusion, you know, of it's an illusion. Exactly. Democracy is an illusion Mm -hmm. uh, and has a lot of defects, (laughs) you know, but Probably Thanks for articulating that, Oscar. <laughs> That's really yeah, important. But, but probably is the 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 less worse, you know, okay. the, yeah. not not the worst, but th- there are worse ways of Absolutely, doing things. Yeah. So I think it's uh, it's not good, but it's the best thing we can do. Anyway, Ch- China is is doing things very very good, uh, and probably. Uh, 
they, they are leveraging their control, their excessive control, because that, that's the, the only difference. The difference is that here people can take the, people can take go, uh, a president out of, of there in four years. So they are more careful in China that doesn't happen. So the control and the kind of, uh, yeah, that, that control from the government is more visible in China than yeah. in Europe or, or in any Western country mm -hmm. uh, or in the US. But it, it's about the same. The, they have laws, they have rules, we can think that the rules are not according to us, to our point of view, but it's it's a, a rule. I mean, it's not a wild country. It's not a, anarchic. It's not chaos. It's order. Uh, and but more restrictive. Are... Would you say it's more, I mean, with all, everything, whatever, uh, you know, I'm always critical, you know, what I hear and what I, what I watch, but with all this, you know, a social credit system and... <laughs> Uh, the lockdown. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. What's yeah, going the social the, the citizenship. For instance, you cannot live in a city if you don't have a work. I mean, uh, things that here we can believe that that is yeah. a, a way of doing things, but it works for them. Even Singapore has that kind of uh, living. I mean, most of the of of the uh, apartments or buildings in in Singapore. It's, it's owned by the government and the government makes a, a long list to people that wants to live there. No one, not everyone can go there and live in I Singapore. I see. Wow. So in, in Asia, it's very common that way of thinking uh, because probably they have feudalism more clo closer in time than what we had here in Europe or, or in the US, mm -hmm. in the Western countries, you know. So basically the china the best thing that they have they, they have many bad things like uh human rights violations and all that that uh really we, we should have done it better when we helped china to improve in uh, during the 90s and and the 2000 that we we move a lot of companies there to help them. We transfer a lot of technology, nuclear technology, aviation. Uh, so we should have forced them to do things better. Right now, we cannot change that. They are too powerful to, to, to change. I mean, to be forced to, to change their way of doing bad things. But they also have good things. For instance, they can plan ahead. And they plan usually for 100 years. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, am yeah, it's amazing. So yeah. they have long term planning at a country uh, level. So that is really something amazing. That is something that we don't do anywhere in the Western countries. Yeah. We plan for four years or as much as 10 years. And then the plans are very fuzzy, in the, you know, 10 years and maybe who knows. You know, but uh, we don't have a long-term plan, long-term objectives. We are, we see the current, go our governments like firefighters trying mm -hmm. to extinguish quick fires and to maintain the, to, to keep the, their seats, not long-term planning. And that is what I miss. And that would be compatible with, with democracy. I mean, we can have here in the state, we call it bipartisan because we, we have two main parties. So bipartisan agreements means that it's something that can be long-term because everyone agrees on that, the, the vast majority. So that is the way forward. And we should have that kind of planning. And I think that that kind of planning is good for democracy. And I'm not talking about planning every little thing because I'm not so... Uh, I mean, things have to be planned, but at the top level, not very low level. So having a vision for the country and a mission for the different components, for the different departments or ministries uh, of a country is critical. It's critical. 
And I've seen many times, very common in Europe, not that common here in the States, uh, creating new ministry, ministry of whatever, or change the name, or when a new president comes in, it changes the names or the distribution of how everything works. That doesn't work. You cannot be in a constant change. Uh, I mean, you have to think about that, and that has to be a bipartisan agreement because otherwise in four years the next one will come and we'll change everything again mm -hmm. and it, it those large organizations they need that two three years to settle down and and to 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 be efficient if you are if every four years you are changing and it takes three years to 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 be efficient you only have one year of efficiency out of four that doesn't work yeah um, so yeah. That's the problem of democracy, mm -hmm. of our democracy. Exactly. That, yeah. that could be fixed. That's that's the, the big thing that we can, the same way China can learn from the rest of the world from for human rights and democracy and how things can be done better, we can learn from China on how we can do things better. Yeah. I mean, uh, we still have to, con you know, admit that there are blatant human rights <laughs> violations, even in Western or, you know, developed or whatever in, in these, even in Europe or United States or other continents. Uh, but just, I don't know, they can, they are able to obfuscate it or somehow, you know, don't make it so obvious. Uh, it's a chapter for itself. Uh, what I want to ask you is like, uh, you we talked about China, would you say that China, these three countries, because I'm myself uh, born in Iran, but I grew up in Austria and in the United States. Would you say uh, uh, China, Russia, and, in, and Iran, um, would you say they are technologically in some sectors, uh, segments, like much further advanced or have more advantages? Or Oh, yeah. Can you like list a few examples? Like yeah, examples. Uh, well, two, two very clear. One is hypersonics that Russia and China are ahead of the, of the, of the United States and or, or Japan or UK. And the other is nuclear technology. Uh, China is now uh, the, 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 the first one in, in, in nuclear technology, uh, along with Russia. They are more or less the same, but China is building a lot of, of plants. Uh, and they are reducing the cost. They are reducing the the time. They 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 are now at about uh, nineteen hundred uh, dollars per per kilowatt of um, of cost. That here in the states is about five times larger. Jesus. Okay, that's amazing. So uh, they are they they've done what. Western countries did in the 60s, that is making nuclear inexpensive mm -hmm. and reliable. So, uh, and, and Russia is doing the same. I mean, they, 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 they have the most advanced, uh, designs are, are there in, 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 in Russia and China. Here, here we have a lot of designs. Uh, we have about 80 startups and large companies trying to implement the the uh, small modular reactors, mm -hmm. but uh, but we have the the nuclear the NRC the 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 Nuclear Regulatory Commission that is a political agency committee that is anti-nuclear so you have a, a regulating body that is that is anti-nuclear <laughs> so that's why here in the states in the last 20 years we only built one uh one power plant the the bottle that that is a disaster because it's one of the reasons of building... oscar because it's so stigmatized nuclear energy nuclear technology or is it, is it like a like a combination of other factors and reasons well, well, basically, it was the the oil and gas industry I fighting see. against it uh -huh. in the in the seventies. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they funded, for instance, here in California. California is is, is like Germany; it's very anti-nuclear. But that anti-nuclear thing is uh, is something that that comes from that, and and they got the money. The friends of the earth here in in California, they got the money from. From the oil and gas industry, it was very notorious. In the, I don't remember the name, Richard. 
don't really remember the name, but uh, it, it gave about, it funded uh, Friends of the Earth. They, he gave uh, an equivalent of about $1.5 million at that time to fund the, the organization to, fu to fight against nuclear. And that has expanded similar things happening in Germany uh, with the uh, oil and gas and coal industry trying to fight against uh, against nuclear. So that, that happens here. But China and Russia that are more uh, practical in that sense, so China overall of them, they, they, they see the benefits and that's why China or South Korea that is a democracy, but uh, it has a very practical approach. They, they are also betting on, on nuclear. France did it with very good results. And, and it has been demonstrated that nuclear is capable of reducing emissions and-, and Definitely, yeah. Yeah, for, for instance, France reduced 88% the carbon uh, footprint Mm -hmm. in 15 years. Yes. Sweden did it in 14 years. Mm -hmm. uh, eight, eight, Sweden reduced eight, uh, 80 80 percent or so in in 14 years, also in the 70s, 80s and Sweden. And uh, the same happened in, in Ontario, in, in Canada. They refurbished all nuclear reactors that were closed uh, in the 90s and they reopened it in the uh, from from 2005 to 2015, in 10 years, they they refurbish and and bring back online several nuclear reactors, and they reduce their carbon footprint 80 89 percent mm -hmm. in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, nuclear can help a lot, but the fear that that is not real is is something that uh, is is inside everyone, and and I feel it. I feel it. I grew up uh, in the eighties, nineties, and and I remember thinking that oh, nuclear is bad, it's poisonous, it's radioactive, yeah, it's, but it's so even worse than poison. It's because so stigmatized, also because of the nuclear exactly. weapon, and it's so you know overloaded with negativity and stigmatization. Exactly, it's the mantra that yeah. has been repeated so many times that you have internalized it. And I have it inside too. I have to, to be very, uh, I mean, to, 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 to be very uh, conscious when I talk about nuclear because I, I've i been, I, I had to convert myself. I converted myself from anti-nuclear to pro-nuclear uh, because I read a lot. I learned a lot. I learned all the lies that, that I've been told in, in the past. Mm -mm. By everyone, yeah, I mean, there's the so much propaganda and brainwashing and indoctrination and and missing, you know, just just too so much narratives. Um, and to be honest with you, this whole, I mean, it's I don't want to, you know, go into that uh, carbon thing because I mean, what I hear from you also is, I mean, are you an advocate of carbon using carbon reduction really uh, changes the, I don't know, the the climate? I, I mean, is that really man man made? Well, I think that we we are not going to change the climate by reducing carbon, we're not gonna make it. Okay, thanks. So it's good to moderate our uh, carbon footprint, but I don't think that it, we're going to avoid any change. I don't know if the change is gonna be up or it's gonna be down in temperatures, Yeah. but uh, the earth is constantly changing. Exactly. So the levels of yeah. carbon is not the, the important thing here. Okay. I'm <laughs> okay. somehow more concerned about the rate of carbon emissions. Okay. That, uh, I mean, the, the Earth has had in the past a lot more and a lot less. See? Yeah. So any change, yeah. it's not going to be a big change yeah. for the Earth, for yeah. the ecosystem, for anything. Actually, yeah. CO2 is the... It, 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 it's, it's actually promoting life, right? right? I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it prosper, you know, it makes, makes things grow. I mean, CO2. Ex it's, exactly. It's food for plants, <laughs> for vegetation. So, so 
actually, I'm I'm concerned not about the levels of CO2. I'm concerned about the rate. Okay. Because if, but, if but we on describe, one thing we can agree, I mean, you are an advocate. You mean we can agree of you are for the reduction of environmental pollution. I mean, you know. And that's something we should be working towards, like the environmental pollution, whether it be toxins or I don't know, you know, anything that is toxic, radio, uh, whatever, right. you know, like uh, cancerogenic or, you know, whatever. <laughs> goal is releasing yeah. a lot of uh, PM 2.5 uh, so particulates, yeah. small particulates that yeah. get into our lungs and, and they they remain there. They can even pass the, to the bloodstream. So they are very, very small. And that comes from coal burning, not from gas burning. From gas, what we have is um, uh, only uh, n nitrous oxide that could, in large quantities, could create acid rain, you know, and affect to the re respiratory system. And th there are many concerns about that. So that's why burning things is not the most... Exactly. Yeah. Combustion, of, combustion okay, generally is not good, right? I mean, whether it be cigarette smoking or, or anything. The motivation for pushing on nuclear technology uh -huh. and hopefully in the future for fusion uh, generation is to advance yeah. our civilization. I mean, it, it's clear. The, the, first, the, the first industrial revolution came because we started to use coal mm -hmm. in addition to biomass wood. So that huge amount of energy for about this, the same or less cost, well, uh, the, it made possible to have very cheap industries to develop a lot of uh, industry because we had cheap and abundant energy. The second industrial revolution came with oil and gas. Without oil and gas, we couldn't be flying from one continent to the other. We couldn't have uh, a lot of things that we have today, plastics. I mean, all the materials that we have today comes from oil and gas. So oil and gas is the, the, the is, was an unnecessary part of the second industrial revolution mm -hmm. uh, and, it, it's been really, really good. I mean, it has bad things like coal. Coal uh, was the the reason of the of the first industrial revolution, but also brought bad things. But you know, anything in this world, even the best thing in the world, has bad things, and even the worst thing in the world has good things. Yeah. So, but what we need is it advanced humanity. I mean, otherwise we couldn't have this kind of growth, and you know, actually we reduce poverty. Of, you know, in a general sense, right? Yeah. Globally, it's a lot better. Obviously, it has bad things, but globally, it helped. Yeah. Right now, we are ready. And I think that we were ready uh, 70, well, not 70, but probably 50, 60 years ago for the third industrial revolution. And actually, we had it more or less. We had the, the technology. We had the computers and everything that comes with it, with the semiconductors artificial intelligence, software, uh, you know, communications, all that came from uh, part of the second industrial revolution, but it's the seed for the third one. But we need a, a portion, very uh, a very important portion for the next industrial revolution, which is abundant and cheap energy. Exactly, yes. Yeah, so that's why I think that the only way forward to have a huge amount of energy that could replace uh, part of the oil and gas and bring even more for future uses such as, I don't know, feed powerful supercomputers, quantum computers, uh, artif large artificial intelligence systems, all that requires a lot of energy. So in order to feed all that and to make it a general thing, then we will need more energy. If right. we want to generate all the hydrogen we need for replacing aviation, that would require a lot of energy, uh, generate that hydrogen, manufacture the hydrogen. So we need a lot more energy and we need it very inexpensive. Yeah. So I, I believe that the only way is going nuclear.
Exactly. Until fusion has been developed. That yeah. is the next step. And then the the thing beyond, I think there is something beyond fusion. I think it's, I would call it plasma or magnetic or gravitational. But anyway, it's maybe well, that, that much is... further in the future. But uh, I think this conversation is really important, uh, uh, Oscar, because with all this, you know, ESG and, you know, vilifying of energy bullshit that's going on, it's, 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 like, it's so anti-human anti-growth and anti-civilization it's not uh, really not really the, but look at the I, narrative esg esg mm -hmm. is a good thing and being concerned about the environment about our health and about this the long-term existence of our civilization and our environment is good yeah but and, who's the narrator you know i mean the intention is is not yeah. there you know, it's, uh, you, know, you know, we're all worried about environmental pollution, about environment, about, you know, sustainability, whatever you want to call it, you know, like growth and health. Sustainability is is a very confusing word. It's like renewable. Mm -hmm. I mean, we call wind and solar renewables, but, or unsustainable, mm -hmm. but they are neither renewable or mm -hmm. sustainable. Yeah. They are not renewable because a solar panel, when... It's done after 20 years. Yeah. It it's costs huge. a lot of money. A lot of, a lot of waste. Yeah. I mean, look at all yeah, this. And generate a lot of electronic waste. Exactly. Yeah. All these windmills. That is polluting because it has heavy metals. Yeah, exactly. And those pollutants remain pollutants forever. Forever, yeah. Unlike nuclear uh, waste that fast... They can be recycled, uh, right? Reactors. They found out how to recycle, right? That's what you publish. Yeah, they, we knew it. I mean... Nuclear waste is not a problem. It has never been a problem. Mm -hmm. It's a problem for those that don't want to see the solution that are anti-nuclear. Because fast breather reactor can transmute those uh, transuranic actinids that are the, the source of, that, of the radioactivity of the uh, used fuel. Because it's used fuel, it's not waste. I mean... Light water reactors, that is what we've had in the last decades, they they can burn about from three to five percent of the of the fuel. So what we have is partially used fuel, partially, very partially, only three to five percent. So the there is a lot of energy in what we call waste. So what is the actual waste? The actual waste is not using it. The actual ways would be to bury it in, in permanent uh, uh, deposits. No, no. The, the deep ge geological uh, is not the solution. It's, it would be waste. I mean, would you put gold again inside the mine? No. <laughs> well, it's like, it, it's the same. It's yeah, useful. It has it. A, a lot of energy, mm -hmm. actually. If we use fast nuclear reactor, I mean, if we, those are called generation four reactors. Yeah. If generation four reactors that are nothing new, I mean, the, the, we know the technology since the fifties, it's nothing new. And, and Russia, they have several of them. And France had the, the super Phoenix that was a fast breeder reactor and was operating for, for many years. Uh, so it's not new. It's just a matter of deciding to go into that way. But when fast nuclear reactors were under development in many countries, including Germany, Germany has a very good one. Uh, then uh, the anti-nuclear uh, movement mm, made the nuclear to stagnate, you know, uh, during uh, at the end of the 90s. Yeah. And then after 20 years, China and Russia, again, they are developing that technology. Mm -hmm. And and here in the States too, basically the Terra Power Natrium is, is a fast reactor. It's not a breather reactor because it's too small. It's a, an SMR. But a larger version of the natrium could could be uh, very, I mean, could, could burn uh, used fuel. Mm -hmm. You know, to put this into perspective, and to see how powerful nuclear energy is, the natrium reactor or the Terra Power natrium reactor backed by Bill Gates, 
or the X Energy, the XC100, that is another SMR under development in, in, in the US. The, the, the waste generated by the energy required by a person for the whole life, for 80 years, would be 170 grams. 170 grams of waste for your whole life. That's amazing. Wow. Okay. That is a little bit more than two grams, two yeah. grams per year. So ridiculous. Yeah. Per person. Yeah. Is... So oh, yeah. compare that to the tons mm -hmm. of ashes yeah. and CO2 released by oil and gas. And the environmental pollution in general. Yeah. 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 So basically, it's nuclear is clearly the way forward. Yeah. And and it's not against ASG. It's clean. It's, it's, it's the cleanest one. Well, it's it really clean. The, yeah, it's very it's fireably clean. clean. But it's not only clean. It's safe. It's the it's safest safe. yeah. energy and source efficient. we have. Yeah, and cheapest, wouldn't you say? Yeah. yeah. I I used to compare nuclear. Nuclear is to energy uh, like uh, as, um, aviation is to transportation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very efficient. It's very fast. I mean, it's... It, it's very powerful. It takes you there very, very quick. And nuclear generates a lot of energy. And it's very, very safe. It's the safest without any, I mean, statistics are very, very conclusive. I mean, can be more conclusive. Nuclear is the safest. Nuclear is the cleanest. But in the event of an accident, yes, it's deadly. It can have deadly consequences. It, it's not actually that deadly. Yeah, but even the safety measures or, you know, the technolog technologies, you know, making it more safe, more, keep, you know, more secure has been like, hasn't it like exponentially increased in the last few decades? I mean, <laughs> how it isn't. Yeah. And it's because of that, because we couldn't have mass producing them because anti-nuclear uh, people uh, fun funded by oil and gas uh, lobbies, and followed by naive uh, green followers that they confuse. Nu they, they, they see nuclear as it, it's polluting and it's not polluting at all. Generate a lot less waste than any other uh, yeah. uh, source of energy. And and it's like aviation. I mean, yes, in, in an event of an accident, it's deadly and, and a lot of people can die. But for instance, in Chernobyl, only 140 people suffer from acute radiation syndrome mm -hmm. and 28 died. Yeah. So if you put all that together, a single uh, aircraft crash kills more than than, yeah. than this amount of people. Yeah. So and people doesn't stop flying because of that. Exactly. Yeah. Why are we stopping creating nuclear plants? Mm -hmm. Because one in the history killed that, that amount of people. One, because in Fukushima, no one died. No one had a, a, acute uh, radiation syndrome. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. The people who died was because of the tsunami, not because of the accident in the in the nuclear plant. Yeah. There's no a lot one. of information and I don't know, there's just too yeah. much, a lot of mainstream propaganda too behind it. So yeah, also but, they, but they, there is a, a, a team from, from the United Nations created specifically for reviewing the Fukushima af afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm I'm based on, on that report, the un yeah. unclear um, report. And I mean, it's, it's like that. And, and the data I, I, I'm because saying is from, from that because yeah. I had to, to look at it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, for instance, the, the Three Mile Island, the famous accident in here in the US, that, that was a partial, very partial meltdown of the core mm -hmm. and released small amount of radiation. The radiation that that uh, that was leaked was equivalent, equivalent for the radiation that you receive in an aircraft in a flight from LA to New York. Yeah. Because obviously when you fly, there, there are more cosmic rays that, that Increase the radiation, yeah, uh, a lot. <laughs> but it's 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 hard. It's not it doesn't. I mean, it's it's safe. Uh, 
So for, for instance, another, another good uh, thing, another good data that is very eye-opening is that Fukushima, uh, Chernobyl, everyone thinks that it's radioactive, it's a radioactive land that is dangerous to be there. No. One year, one year after the accident in, in the 87, one year after that, the radiation in Chernobyl was about half of the radiation, the natural radiation that you can find in, in Guarapari in Brazil, for instance, that is a very touristic city near Rio de Janeiro. And right now, right now, it, it's about one tenth of the radiation, natural radiation that you can receive on the beach in, in Guarapari in Brazil. So really you have to put things into perspective to learn about, about how the society, the, the oil and gas lobby has been spreading lies and fear yeah. against the, the best energy source that we have developed so far exactly and there's also been like this blocking or or, or preventing like like the lack of funding like <laughs> like if there was a joint effort uh the multinational whatever like if there was a you know a sufficient like relatively sufficient money to fund this i mean wouldn't be because that was the final question i was going to ask you just i'm respectful of your time thanks so much for this fascinating yeah, conversation sure. so important to uh, inform people and to you know make people understand the bigger picture here. Um, like you, you also published you know some articles about the you know, nuclear powered uh, icebreakers you know Russia or nuclear model uh, modular reactors. Would it be realistic uh, when it comes to transportation? You know, like cars or you know tra on ground to have modular reactor powered. I, I just I'm going to call it like that. Yeah, uh, vehicles. For instance, trains. Trains could be uh, nuclear power with a with a micro reactor. No problem. Uh, uh, boats, obviously, all the all the large uh, container vessels in our oceans, they could be powered with with nuclear uh, propulsion. They they do not require that much. Icebreakers are more powerful than than the engines in in those mega boats. Uh, Crews. Uh, around the world, imagine you don't need to to refuel in seven years. So uh, the operations at ports could be a lot faster. Uh, they don't need to refuel. So uh, it's it's a lot better. For aviation, it's more complicated because the the weight of a nuclear reactor is too much. Uh, but probably the, a few. If fusion gets, uh, I mean, compact fusion reactors, they could be a way of power mm -hmm. future aviation and getting rid of batteries, hydrogen. Exactly. And yeah. So there, there wouldn't be like a technical, I mean, would it be technically possible if there was the willingness? No, it's technically possible. I mean, uh, as long as fusion could be achieved. Okay. But for nuclear uh, ground systems, they could be power. Wow. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Trains are, are and sea. Yeah. Well, that's this is uh, mind boggling. Mind boggling. Uh, this is yeah, actually they, hope, make, makes makes a lot of hope. It creates a lot of hope and optimism. I mean, when you hear those these, you know, these facts and the reality behind it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and as soon as you remove your fear with mm -hmm. facts, I mean, not with I, I really encourage everyone to read about nuclear from people who knows about nuclear, not journalists that they just spread uh, things. But uh, get into that because if you don't, there is a lot more misleading information out there than good information from the right sources. I agree with you totally. Yeah. No, so, thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I encourage everyone to read and to yeah. learn. Yeah, and to get different point of views. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. There's there's a handful, um, not not too many, but I I mean I've read a lot and been a lot into these rabbit holes since because it's all interconnected. Especially when you go into the rabbit hole of Bitcoin, <laughs> it, 
you know, you, yeah. you, it's un, you know, it's not avoidable. You, Bitcoin you, could, could leverage uh, the, the you know, Bitcoin requires a lot of energy. If yeah. you have cheap energy, that would be also a, a solution. And that's the advantage of Bitcoin. You don't need to transport the energy. You just go to the place, to the site where the energy source is, and you just mine Bitcoin, you know? Exactly. Would it be volcano like in El Salvador, geothermal energy or... You know, dams or water or hydrogen or whatever that is. You know, uh, so uh, it's yeah. You can put it in Iceland. It could be cool yeah. outside and and using geothermal energy and wow. it's clean and that's what yeah well, yeah and it yeah this is this this will trigger I think hyperbitcoinization and you know the, the 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 exponential evolution of humanity. So yeah, Oscar, clear... thank you so much again. You know for this conversation. I think it's yeah. it's uh, overdue, and uh, I think it, a lot of topics. I have think I'm gonna break down, or at least with keywords or short descriptions. Where can people find you? Or are there any like any any final thoughts? Where can people find your resources? Um, well, uh, uh, you can find me in LinkedIn. Just look for uh, Oscar Martin and uh, you will find me i know if you can i can share with you well you can share my my i'll put it in the show notes yeah link because i i used to use that that uh social network no it's it's really fascinating the the amount and <laughs> the depth of 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 your of your you know commentary your expertise the the publications the articles that you comment on it's i mean uh otherwise i we wouldn't have like really such a deep insight you know what's really going on <laughs> you know uh in research and development on uh would it be you know energy high you know <laughs> uh aerospace or quantum computing uh, artificial intelligence energy uh and propulsion systems yeah i love anything technology in, in <laughs> yeah. all the areas that's the impression I have, yeah. Well, Oscar, thank you so much again. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap it up? Well, thank, thank you so much for, for being here with you. It's been a very uh, interesting conversation. And my pleasure, my honor. Thank you so much again. And well, see you soon. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. Maybe we can have a conversation in the new future sometime with, together with Jeff. That. that would be a really fruitful discussion, the two of you, because you would really complement one another. <laughs> Uh, but let's see. Yeah, I'll get back to you. Well, thank you so much again for your time. Oscar, thank you. bye. Bye.